critical perspectives on the news is produced by the Interreligious Council of Lynn County, which is solely responsible for its content. The views and opinions expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect those of the staff and management of KCRG TV9. Good morning and welcome, welcome to Ethical Perspectives on the News. I am your moderator, Carl Cassell, President and CEO of Horizons. The United States has the highest rate of gun violence in the developed world, six times higher than Canada and 15 times more than Germany. In mass public shootings, defined as when four or more people are killed, the U.S. leads as well. There are an estimated 33,000 gun-related deaths, which include accidents, suicide, and murder every year in this country. The sheer number of guns in the U.S. is clearly a key factor, but many believe Americans' apparent willingness to accept these gun violence, except this gun violence, plays an important role. We look at how Americans' attitudes towards restrictions on guns compared to those in industrialized countries. We are going to deal specifically uh, here with gun violence in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And we have my three distinguished panelists today. To my immediate left, we have Stacy Walker, community activist. Good morning. Morning. To his immediate left, we have Cedar Rapids Chief of Police, Wayne German. Good morning, morning Carl. And on the end, we have S Susie Wynott, City Council Member. Good morning. Good morning, Carl. So thank you for joining us today. First question, um, mainly probably for you, Chief German, since you've uh, been in law enforcement for a good number of years. Um, what is, is there been a change in gun violence in the last 20 years? And is it more pervert? pervasive or not? And if so, why would you say it has? Well, certainly in the last 20 years, there's been an increase, but uh, specifically um, the, the last two years, we've seen a marked increase all across the country. Uh, a, a number of factors are driving, driving this uh, issue, and, and uh, not only myself, but the other police chiefs across the country are very concerned about it. Um, the gun-related homicides uh, in, in major cities, Milwaukee, Washington, D.C., Chicago, are, are at all-time highs. And um, again, uh, I think w we have met several times to discuss the causes uh, that, that is pushing this. And uh, the, the, the chiefs accept, as, as well as a lot of the elected officials, that it's more of a societal uh, issue that needs to be addressed. And, and that's what we're looking to do here in Cedar Rapids. Perfect. I want to ask uh, for each of your opinion. Um, I'm going to read the Second Amendment of the United States Constitution. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, my question, and it, it, please give me your opinions. Do gun enthusiasts take the Second Amendment out of context? What are your opinions on it? And is, is this... Um, should we, should there be change in laws? Is this still uh, 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 viable today? You know, I don't think uh, <clears throat> that there needs to be uh, too much debate about it. I mean, the Second Amendment is very clear that, uh, you know, citizens have the right to bear arms, um, but I think most folks who are pushing for sensible uh, gun reform uh, feel as if we don't have to abridge the Second Amendment or we don't have to violate the Second Amendment to make sure our citizens are safe. Uh, you know, a lot of things that, you know, I hear and I read about when it comes to the gun debate uh, has to do with uh, sensible measures, universal background checks, has to do with making sure we're keeping guns out of the hands of folks um, who may have severe mental illnesses or folks who have a history of violence. Um, and, you know, the majority of gun enthusiasts in this country probably don't fit that bill. And so what we need to do is have a, a deeper conversation with gun enthusiasts and folks who are trying to pass sensible gun reform and find the common ground that I think is there. We just need uh, some courageous politicians to try to breach that gap. So well, I agree with everything that Stacy has said. I think that we also need to uh, look at not just federal, but we need to look at our state laws and, and what that looks like. And that, you know, when President Obama had tried to push some gun reform 
was it more of a reactionary issue that ended up occurring with people going out and getting more guns and then perhaps more fo got into the hands of more folks that shouldn't have the guns? And then we had in our own state legislature where we had um, the issue law. And what is that, Chief? Shall issue. Shall issue. So then it took away local control from our sheriff's department, and, and Chief may be able to speak some more about that. Uh, directly related to that, yes. I, I believe that the sheriffs here in, in the state uh, need to be given the discretion back uh, to uh, make their decisions on whether or not someone who is applying for a, a carry permit uh, the sheriffs need that discretion uh, to decide whether or not an individual, um, you know, may be a danger in, in being issued a permit to carry and, and thereby increasing the danger to the community. Uh, currently, uh, I think their hands are tied and restricted and they don't possess that. Mm -hmm. uh, what Stacy said is, is spot on. We need to depoliticize um, the, the debate about sensible gun reform. Um, you know, we're not looking to take guns or, or restrict persons who lawfully and responsibly own and possess weapons. That's not what I'm seeing as being an issue here in Cedar Rapids or an issue across the country. What we're seeing is dangerous individuals who are prohibited from uh, owning and possessing firearms are somehow uh, gaining access and, and carrying and using these firearms. And, and those are the measures that we need to address. And, and we need to have the universal background checks and, and also look for some other measures that uh, we can uh, put into place to, again, enhance the community safety. All of you mentioned um, national conversation, federal legislation. Um, why has there been a national silence uh, from some of our uh, legislators in D.C. on uh, uh, reform um, perspective? And um, should, should D.C. be more involved or, as you said, it should be more of a local issue? What, what are your thoughts? Well, um, ag again, I, I think uh, depoliticizing the issue is a start. However, um, you know, the president, after Sandy Hook, um, made what I felt was, was some reasonable um, uh, pieces of legislation uh, and presented uh, this legislation to Congress. Um, these measures were endorsed by police chiefs across the country as, as sensible, reasonable, and very, very necessary. And uh, this was immediately following the, the, the massacre in, in, in Sandy Hook, um, Newtown, Connecticut. And um, sadly, uh, no, no action was taken. Um, so unfortunately, that, that's the state that, that we're in, uh, but again, uh, I'm looking to depoliticize and um, let, let's try to unite this country and this community to recognize the fact that, uh, you know, seldom the, the many days go by when we don't hear or see a, another mass um, murder incident in, involving guns. Uh, and again, uh, th there's a number of factors that come into play. Uh, with, with this issue that really seriously needs to be looked at. Uh, the societal issues, the mental health component, the poverty component, uh, low unemployment, you know, what is driving people, criminals, recidivists, into constantly going back to carry a firearm, not only carrying it, but using it. Uh, th those are the, the issues that I think we can have some impact in, um, and, and that's what we should we should be promoting. Either one of you want to weigh in on that? I was just going to say, if we, if we begin to talk about the mental health issue, you know, that's a very sensitive issue, and it's a very serious issue. So it's something that needs to be given attention as well. But so oftentimes, it, it may be, a, we look at it as a national issue, but we really need to be looking at what can we do within our own community to affect the change that we want to see, or at our state level within the state of Iowa. What, do, what is conducive to um, 
our state. What does our state want to look like? What do Iowans want to want to be known for? So while we can look at federal legislation, I really think that it behooves us to look at what are our state laws. And then I think that locally, we need to come together as a community, as we have been doing, and look at do we consider gunfire the issue or do we consider that just a symptom of a, a deeper um, systemic issue? Yeah, um, you know, I'll just I'll just come out and say it. You know, there is a silence in Washington D.C. because there are powerful um, special interest groups um, that are in the business of keeping gun manufacturers in business. Um, and when you have scenarios like that, issues that should be straightforward and devoid of politics become hyper politicized, mm -hmm. and good legislation kind of um, gets washed out. Um, it becomes a, a third rail um, issue, meaning if you touch it and you're on the wrong side of, and you cross the wrong side of a special interest group, there are electoral consequences for that. And, um, you know, uh, earlier I mentioned we have a desperate need for courageous politicians to be willing to stand up to some of these interest groups and say, hey, we've got police chiefs, we've got the law enforcement community, um, all saying that we ought to take a smarter approach to gun reform uh, using sensible measures. These are things that um, would not be punitive to gun owners. These are things that exist to make society safer. Um, and it's really a reflection of where we are as a society that we can't find common ground and um, get these measures passed uh, through Congress. That's an unfortunate uh, sort of commentary on where we are. Very good. Well, let's bring this back a little more locally. Is violent crime, is gun crime trending upward in Cedar Rapids? Um, and if so, why do we think that is? Uh, uh, and if not, what measures have been put in place to minimize that? Well, the uh, statistics show that violent crime uh, year to date um, is lower this year than the same time last year. However, um, the the incidence of shots fired and and gun uh, gunfire has increased this year uh, compared to last year. So so that is very concerning. It it's been a a, a real concern of mine um, for for a long time now. Um, we do have uh, a, a lot of issues that. Uh, and, and programs that we've put into place um, to uh, attack these concerns. Uh, I, I think the, the, the number one, uh, I guess, plus in all this is, is the community awareness and the community cooperation is improving and is increasing. We are getting those calls where before, uh, for whatever reason, we didn't get the calls of, of the shots fired. So, so that is, is pushing the numbers up and, and you know, I'm, I'm not, that concerned about the numbers being put up. But, but what I want to emphasize is, is the city of Cedar Rapids is still a very safe city. Um, the, the gun violence that is occurring between individuals in this city uh, is not random. The, the, the shootings that have occurred have been targeted incidents of, of people who have known one another, uh, are acquainted with one another, have some sort of dispute, disagreement, or a beef with one another, and, and they choose uh, to settle or, or resolve their differences through through uh, the use of firearms. Um, so so these incidents are, are not random uh, acts of violence where where citizens should uh, be fearful, but uh, uh, we, we have taken measures to increase uh, the visibility. We do have some some other. Uh, uh, measures in place uh, later this spring. The police community action team is going to uh, uh, come into operation. We've also got the license plate reader system that that we'll be utilizing to identify persons who are wanted. And um, so, so I'm confident in the direction that we're going. And, and then again, um, some other community groups have have been formed and are working together to address the systemic issue that. Again, as, as Ms. Wynock said, that gun violence is a symptom, and it's a symptom of, 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 of a greater cause or, or uh, what, what is plaguing this, this community. Anything else either one of you want to add? I know that 
wasn't specifically the chief and the stats, but if there was a point you wanted to add, please feel free. Well, I think, it, it, Carl, it just, it, everything that chief is saying, we know that we're doing as a city, mm -hmm. but then it's a society issue. Mm -hmm. So when we begin talking about this, it's what are we doing as a society and what do we want to look like? Where do we want to be in 10 years? Where, what do we, what's our hope? for our children and, and the hope for our city. So I think that we're on the right path with the things that we're doing as a city, and I also think that we're on the right path with the community conversations that are taking place and the people that are coming to the table. We are seeing people come to a, a table and sit together that have virtually never sat together before for various reasons, whatever they may be. So I believe that as a community, we understand and we look to the future and that we're, we're really working together to say, we want Cedar Rapids to be the best that it can be. Just a quick point, um, you know, obviously in agreement with everything that was said, we do know that incidents of, of gun violence um, are down uh, this year, um, but we still know that we've got a lot of work to do. Um, and as uh, Councilwoman Wynock alluded to, uh, we're encouraged by the community efforts that are, are being kind of set up um, to still address uh, the gun violence that remains. And while we may not get to zero instances of gun violence in a year, although that would be ideal, um, I'm encouraged too that these joint efforts are gonna help uh, address some of these issues. And so does gun safety education work uh, to reduce firearm injuries amongst youth or are the, are the education components working to uh, steer kids away from it? I mean, what, what are your thoughts? Uh, we have education, but is that enough? Uh, firearm safety education is, is... Well, Carl, any education is good education, right? I mean, but when we talk about education, there's many components to that, and that includes being adults. And what, what do we choose as entertainment? So we can start going into that conversation. So we're educating, but you know what? You're educating your child every day, mm -hmm. what you do, and the walk you walk not just your talk. They're watching everything that you do. So if we're talking specifically to youth and gun violence, mm -hmm. yes, education helps, but that the education isn't just done by our police department or, or you know, our teachers. It, it's by us. So as parents, as siblings, older siblings, as guardians, children are sponges. They're looking up to us. So they're absorbing anything and everything we do. So that takes us to the point of television violence, violence that we see in many different forms. We have to remember that education comes in many ways, not just education as we think of education in a classroom. If uh, on October 21st we had the first uh, gun pledge day that uh, the United States Attorney's Office and, and various law enforcement here in Cedar Rapids, Lynn County and Marion participated with the uh, Cedar Rapids schools and, and the college uh, district schools and and what we did is we challenged uh, those students to pledge um, not to bring a gun to school and not to use a gun to resolve their differences mm -hmm. again this was a an initiative sponsored by and uh, uh, promoted by the United States Attorney's Office who is in partnership with law enforcement to go after the worst of the worst uh, um, we, we have uh, formed a, a, a close partnership in utilizing federal statutes to go after uh, felons who possess firearms and drug users who possess firearms. But um, if we can prevent someone coming into possession of a firearm, and again, a child who, uh, you know, two weeks ago you saw in uh, Chicago, a uh, six-year-old shot his three-year-old brother uh, with a gun and, and, and killed him. Uh, tragic. It's, it's tragic. We, again, uh, I'm not looking to take guns away from lawful and responsible gun owners, but um, we, we need to promote sensible and responsible gun ownership. And um, leaving a gun uh, where a six-year-old child has access to it is, is um, um, you know, you're, you're setting up a recipe for disaster and, and unfortunately a, a three-year-old lost his life. We, we, we see it too frequently. How, how well does the storage of guns in homes work? Is that a safe means? And does it, if having your gun locked, if, if, if uh, 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 a response from a, a gun owner would say, well, if someone breaks in my home, having it locked, I would never get to it. Um, what are the odds that they wouldn't be able to, and is it safe to have, or is it better to have your guns locked up or not in your home? 
You know, I you know I think this would be a good question for Chief German, but for what it's worth, I r read an article as recently as this morning. I think it was NPR that sort of challenged the idea um, that you are less safe because you properly secure your firearms in the home, um, and challenged the idea that you are more safe because you have firearms uh, in your home. Um, and there's going to be research that goes back and forth uh, on that very issue. But I think the bottom line is, is that we have to do our due diligence as a society to make sure that firearms aren't coming into the hands of, of folks who um, are not qualified to operate a firearm. And in the case that Chief German alluded to, you've got a six-year-old being able to access a weapon. Um, that, again, um, says more about where we are as a society than anything else in that we can't meaningfully address that, and we owe it to ourselves, um, and we owe it to our children, particularly, you know, uh, gun owners who have children in the home. Um, we owe it to ourselves and to those children to do the best we can uh, to figure out how we can secure firearms in the home. And those conversations, um, you know, aren't particularly appetizing to elected officials, but we need to find a better way to, to have these conversations and to pass uh, legislation to keep, um, you know, our, the most vulnerable amongst us safe in their homes. Exactly what Stacy says, that, you know, we need to figure out how to restrict uh, access um, to guns that children shouldn't have their, have their hands on, and those who, besides children, as Stacy had said. The other part is, is that we need to be very cognizant of how we go about doing that, because we do have our amendments and, and we do have our laws. But, you know, perhaps there are things like how a gun breaks down that can be looked at. Other things besides just education, but in how we manufacture guns and what they look like. And, you know, another piece of that is, um, in another vein is, you know, why would we ever need a military type rifle that has 100 shots in it or, or a large magazine. Um, I don't understand some of that as, as far as the law goes. But I do think that Chief German would probably have a very unique perspective because as a public servant, in the role that he serves, he has a gun every day. I'm sure that his gun probably goes home with him. He's ha he has a child of his own, so I'm, I'm, I would be kind of curious to, to hear what he says about how he has dealt with that himself and kept his family safe, right? Well, uh, there's a number of ways to secure your weapon to, to make it safe so that if someone were to uh, come upon it, it, it would not fire. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, depending on the type of gun, uh, you can break it down so it's totally inoperable. Um, there's trigger guards, trigger locks. Uh, and th there's, our, there's multiple ways of, of making a gun safe um, so that someone who doesn't know if it's a toy or or a, a weapon, um, you know, done, does not come across it and and have a tragedy result. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, um, I, I think we're somewhere in the neighborhood between 25 and 30 instances just within Cedar Rapids this year, where gun owners have left a firearm in their vehicle and an unattended vehicle and, and has been stolen. So, so those are 25 more weapons that I need to worry about, that my officers need to worry about, and the citizens of the city need to worry about that have gone into the hands of a criminal because they've broken into a car and, and they've, they've now have access to a lethal weapon, okay? A gun is not a computer, it is not uh, a, a cell phone, it is a lethal weapon, and it's uh, extremely irresponsible for someone to leave it in a vehicle. So you guys are all involved in initiatives, uh, uh, all involved in initiatives here in our city and in our area to really try to curb this. Um, we don't have a lot of time, there's five minutes left, but if you guys could each talk about what you're doing, what you see, uh, uh, the means of addressing some of this uh, gun violence in our neighborhoods, um, uh, how you guys are helping or at least pushing the conversation forward starting here. Well, um, you know, I am lucky to uh, belong to a community working group of sorts um, that was co-founded by Councilwoman Wynock of everyone on this stage um, is contributing as well as many other folks in the community 
um, people involved in education, people involved with uh, local elected officials and law enforcement, um, you name it. We've kind of assembled a, a wonderful team of, of, of bright minds to really look at sort of the larger, more systemic issues that if left unchecked, um, kind of manifest themselves in, in things like gun violence down the road. Um, we are hoping to become a task force or commission in joint partnership with the school district and the city to really address these systemic issues. Um, aside from that, you know, I think we all here, um, you know, go to different panel discussions. We all here interface and interact with other folks who have other groups that are interested in solving some of these issues. And so for my part, um, you know, I am trying to insert myself in as many of these community conversations as possible so that we can try to move the needle in reducing gun violence. Okay. Well, um, ever since I've become chief, uh, this has been my number one priority is to address gun violence. And, uh, you know, most recently with the Labor Day tragedies that happened in the city, uh, it's just made us more dedicated and committed. Uh, I'm looking at a, at a really a uh, a tri approach, trifold approach of uh, suppression, which the police are doing an outstanding job with, with uh, enforcing the laws. We've got a partnership with the FBI, with the Safe Streets Task Force. So, uh, th those criminals who uh, we can push federally, we we do. Um, then the middle component is intervention, and uh, we're looking to uh, address intervention techniques and prevention techniques through our enhanced community outreach. So, so we're gonna utilize some other outreach efforts through the police department to our community members that uh, you know, they, they need to avoid uh, this gun violence. And, and there's ways that, that we can address it in, through the think tank, through this community working group, and through some other community groups. Uh, I think we're gonna have success because we, we are committed to, to have this taken care of. Um, I think that Stacy and, and both Chief have, have already hit on, on most of the components that we're doing. They've done a really good job of, of sharing where we're at and where, what, what's going on. But it does take all of us working together um, to make this work, whether it's federal law, state law, local control in the Sheriff's Department, it, all of it all of it. It also takes welling up from grassroots and it takes those folks who are willing to go out and have the uh, get togethers in our parks mm -hmm. and bring everyone together so that there's a sense of community. So the more community that we have, the more we know one another and we know each other very well, um, regardless of where we live and coming out to meet each other and getting to know one another is very, very important to making all of the initiatives that we're talking about here today. Um, and as Stacy said, the group that we've brought together, and uh, it was in response, and Chief alluded to that too, it was in response on, in, on the day in September. And, you know, I called Chief and said, this is just, um, my heart is broken, what's gonna happen here? And I immediately got on the phone to take, you know, to build, bring people together. So we're, we're moving forward and, and we have a good future in front of us. Thank you. And thank all of you for uh, a robust discussion. Thank you, the viewer, for watching this morning. Uh, we certainly uh, aren't done with this conversation. We appreciate uh, uh, the community's willingness to wrap their arms around the issues that we have. Please, uh, 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 as the chief mentioned earlier, voice we do live in a safe city, but we're not done in curbing the violence. So with that, we thank you for joining us this morning on Ethical Perspectives in the News. Again, I am Carl Cassell, and we want to thank our guests uh, for joining us, and have a wonderful week.